Praise Yahweh and Yeshua. Brotherlamps.com He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we uh, we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. Right? So the trumpet or shofar blast of God at the end of the time, at the very last trumpet call. Right? Okay. So when we go to war, God will fight for us. So when we go to war, y'all will fight on our behalf. This is major for the New Testament believers. Spiritual warfare is the name of the game for Christians. So, Numbers 10, 9 says, When you go to war in your land against the adversary who opposes you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. Then you will be remembered before Yahweh your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. So what are they saying here? So we're like, when we blow the shofar, and when they blow the shofar, it was to get God's attention. So God blows the shofar to get our attention. He says, listen, if you blow the shofar, I will remember you. You will get my attention and I will come and fight on your behalf. Awesome, wonderful spiritual things happen in the physical realm, right? But it was the obedience to what God was saying that gave the shofar its power. You know, anybody can go get a ram horn, pick it up and blow it. doesn't mean a thing. It's just like our salvation is based upon a relationship with God. You want things to have spiritual power. If it's praise, worship, prayer, anything, it has to be coupled with obedience, right? Having been given the liberty by Yahweh through his holy word, I desire to blow the shofar at the beginning and the end of the Sabbath every week. These are times of gladness and celebration, not to mention spiritual warfare. I would also blow it at a baptism, a deliverance, the Lord's Supper, etc. I would blow the shofar at any significant spiritual situation in which I desire to praise the Father and Son and for them to draw close and to free us from demonic attack and for them to fight on our behalf. Like the horns of the altar, we now run to Jesus for safety and salvation. Then we use the horn of animals to create and blow the shofar before God. The connection is complete. I believe when we hold the shofar in our hands, we not are only holding the fulfillment of past promises, but also this powerful prophetic instrument signifies a promise yet fulfilled. When Jesus comes with a shout and the blast of the trumpet to redeem the children of God, we hold a spiritual semblance of the horn of our salvation. When we blow the shofar, we are also declaring our own salvation and deliverance through the horn of our salvation jesus the christ for one day he will return with the shout of the trumpet trumpets and we will rise up immortal before him Ooh, yeah praise, praise god. god yes Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his counts upon you and give you shalom. Amen. Praise God. Dear Father, thank you for your love and your blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be here for yet another Bible study. We praise you for this time and opportunity. Please bless us, direct us, guide us, give us the Holy Spirit, guide us your truth, help us to understand the weapons of our warfare and the power of the shofar. And uh, so we thank you for that and thank you for loving us. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Weapons of our warfare, the series part two, the shofar call of God, the power and connection to Jesus. The shofar is a very powerful weapon for believers in Jesus Christ. Just like in part one of weapons of warfare, when we discuss the spiritual power of the blood of Jesus in part two, we will cover how the shofar has a powerful effect in the physical realm. The shofar pierces the veil between the physical and spiritual realm, much like music, prayer, prayer, praise and worship. Yet there is more direct and added layer in the shofar component. The shofar finds its type to its archetype in the temple of God, almost like a bridge between the earth and the gates of heaven. The shofar stands alone in its purpose and function around the throne of heaven and the courts of earth. As we close out the study, we will make the complete connection between the shofar and Jesus our Christ. Then proving that when we hold a shofar as a Christian, we are holding a physical representation of the kingdom of Jesus. Lastly, we'll blow the shofar, releasing the power, uh, full blessing of this weapon of warfare and praise. So I brought my shofar. I've been hiding it. <laughs> it's over there in the back. Yeah, I'll get it and blow it. All right, right. And so here we go. 
Uh, some quick definitions from the Old Testament. Strong's Concordance, H3104, uh, pronounced Yabel, I think. Apparently from H2986, the blast of a horn for its continuous sound, specifically the signal of the silver trumpets. Hence, the instrument itself and the festival thus introduced jubils, ram's horns, trumpets, etc. Strong's Concordance, H7782, which is pronounced Shofar, from H8231 in the original sense, incising a cornet as giving a clear sound or a curved horn, a cornet, a trumpet. And so we want to kind of get the definitions out of the way of that, like a a shofar and a trumpet. Basically, a shofar is used as a trumpet. Then there's actual trumpets. But the whole idea of blowing and announcing uh, with the sound of the horn. Okay, so I, of course, back then making a shofar was easy because you had lambs and goats and stuff like that. You just get one and make one, you know, but making an actual metal instrument took skill and way more effort. So more, most people had just regular shofars. So, so here we are about the shofar of our uh, God, Yahweh. Okay. And so what we're going to do a couple different things. So this is G, uh, God coming down upon the mountain. Okay. So in Exodus 19, 16 through 20, we have had God coming down on the mound and the sound of the trumpet getting louder and louder. So let's look at the uh, top of page two. And we'll notice a, a, a wonderful correlation. It says, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. For this we tell you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will no way precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with God's trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then he who are alive or who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So in Exodus 19, 16 through 20, we had God coming down on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet getting louder and louder. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18, we have God telling us what it's going to be like when God and Jesus come back with the sound of God's trumpet getting louder and louder, right? With the vice of a trumpet. So we're kind of laying the groundwork on here about like how much God loves the trumpet and then why it's important to us. So let's look at the next one. It says, when he calls forth, he says again to show it, it is the trumpet shofar of Yahweh that calls forth his people. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we uh, we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. Right? So the trumpet or shofar blast of God at the end of the time at the very last trumpet call. Right. Okay. So Matthew 24, 30 through 31. And then the sign of the son of man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a great sound of a trumpet or shofar. And they will gather together his chosen ones for the four winds from the uh, end of the sky to the other. Right. And so here we have again, just more examples of this trumpet call, this trumpet blast, right? When God and Jesus call his people to him or call forth or, and he returns, there's a blast of a trumpet. Okay. So Isaiah 27, 12 through 13, it will happen in that day that Yahweh will thresh from the flowing of the streams of Euphrates to the brooks of Egypt, and he will be gathered one by one, children of Israel. It will happen in that day that a great trumpet will be blown, and those who are ready to perish in the land of Assyria and those who are outcast in the land of Egypt shall come, and they shall worship Yahweh in the holy mountain at Jerusalem, right? So here we have that like when God blows the trumpet or his trumpet or the trumpet is blown, that he comes to his people and he calls his people forth. OK. OK. So the next one is when he departs, Yahweh goes up with the sound of a trumpet. Psalms 47, 5. It says God has gone up with the shout. Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. Right. So he, the Bible says he comes with the shout and with the sound of a trumpet here in Psalms 47, 5, it says he departs with a shout and with the sound of a trumpet, okay? 
So we'll keep rocking and rolling here. It says, when he springs forth into action, Yahweh breaks forth into action when the shofar is blown and when he blows it. Zechariah 9, 11 through 17. It says, as for you, because of the blood of your covenant, I have set free your prisoners from the pit in which there is no water. Turn to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today, I declare that I will restore double to you. For indeed, I have been Judah as a bow for me. I have filled uh, with the bow with Ephraim, and I will stir up your sons, Zions against your sons, Greece and make you like the sword of a mighty man Yahweh will be seen over them Yahweh will be seen over them and his arrow will go flash like lightning and the Lord Yahweh will blow the trumpet so the Lord Yahweh will blow the trumpet and will go with the whirlwinds of the south Yahweh of armies will defend them and then uh, and they will destroy and overcome with the sling and stones and they will drink and roar as through wine and they will be filled like bowls like the corners of the altar Yahweh their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people for they are like the jewels of his crown of a crown lifted on high over his head for how great is the goodness and how great is his beauty uh, grain will make the young men flourish new wine the version so i put yahweh will blow shofar to fight with you so we have it in there that yahweh will blow the horn and so um i am encouraged by this right because it says in verse 14 lord yahweh will blow the trumpet so we have the trumpet being blown when he comes down and when he calls forth he blows the trumpet when he's going to fight for you right so we're noticing a trend here and so let's look at the two silver trumpets or shofars it says please remember that the earthly temple was only a shadow of the heavenly temple see hebrews chapter 9 so likewise the two silver trumpets shofar are mentioned in numbers 10 1 through 10 which we are about to read i believe allude to what type of trumpets are in heaven which is the shofar of Yahweh our great God and so we here we we just read that Yahweh will blow the his shofar and so and since we know that the earth was the type of you know or the arc, uh, type of the archetype and so what was on earth and the temple and the design and the layout of the earth and all the instruments and everything used was representing what was in heaven right and so here we have Numbers 10, 1 through 2, talking about the two silver trumpets or shofars. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Make two uh, trumpets of silver. You shall make them of beaten work, and you shall use them for the calling of the congregation and the journeying of the camps. Right? So here we have, on the Israel's journey, we have them having two silver shofars. And these two silver shofars did very good things, which we're about to read. And I broke it down into making it like do this, they did that. And that way we can understand how important these shofars so far as work. So before we begin, let's look at it. it says for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. Numbers 10, 8. The sons of Aaron, the priests shall blow the trumpets. They shall be to you for a statue forever throughout your generations. Okay, so this part's important, which we're going to talk about later, but we have to put it that this is a statue forever throughout your generations, right? And so next one. When the congregation is to be gathered, uh, numbers 10, 3, plus 5 through 7. It says when they blow them, all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the door the tent of meeting verse 5 when you blow an alarm the camps that lie on the east side shall go forward when you blow an alarm the second time the camps that lie on the south shall, mm. side shall go forward they shall blow an alarm for their journey but when the assembly is to be gathered together you shall blow but you shall not sound an alarm right and so there are different types of calls that were used but this is to say the help in institute meetings like this side or that side and everybody goes oh hey, hey guys we gotta go up you know and meet okay and so, which is interesting because we know that Jesus is going to, and God are going to return with the sound of the sound of a trumpet, right? We're going to be called forth. So we kind of see the, uh, uh, the type, you know, or the archetype to the type here of like the, you know, these are representations. Like get used to this because when you hear this noise, you're coming to me. We're going to talk. We're going to have communion of some type. Okay. And so let's read the next one. It says, blow with one trumpet to call forth the leaders. Numbers 10, 4. If you blow just one, then the princes, the head of a thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves to you. So they, when they wanted the leaders to come, they would just blow one. You know, not both of them, right? And so the people walking around doing their daily thing could go, hmm. You know, it's like the dinner bell. <laughs> you know, ding, 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 ding. And so what's the next? So when we go to war, God will fight for us. So when we go to war, y'all will, will fight on our behalf. This is major for the New Testament believers. Spiritual warfare is the name of the game for Christians. So Numbers 10, 9 says, When you go to war in your land against the adversary who opposes you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. Then you will be remembered. 
before Yahweh your God, and you will be saved from your enemies. So what are they saying here? So we're like, when we blow the shofar, and when they blow the shofar, it was to get God's attention. So God blows the shofar to get our attention. He says, listen, if you blow the shofar, I will remember you. You will get my attention, and I will come and fight on your behalf. Right? It says, so this is surely still applies as a weapon of warfare to call upon our Father in the time of need to fight the forces of darkness on our behalf. Okay? And so let's look at the next verse. It says, Ephesians 6, 12. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Right? So we are in spiritual warfare. We're going to talk about that more. All right, for spiritual victory in the physical realm. Okay, so I gave a couple examples here. And now this Bible study is already 11 pages, so I, I didn't put out the whole thing. But So people can go back and do their own homework and references. It says, Joshua in the battle of Jericho, Joshua 6, 5 through 20. Obedience gave power to the call of the shofar for God to give them the victory. Because mm -hmm. remember, they marched around, you know, and on the seventh day, they blew the shofar and yelled and screamed, right? You know, and they got all excited and, and got the victory over Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. And let's look again. Gideon and his 300 versus the Amorites, Judges 7, 16 through 23. Again, obedience gave power to the call of the shofar for God to give them victory, right? They were handed pots and lights and shofars and they had to crash and break and blow the shofar and boom. <laughs> awesome, wonderful, spiritual things happened in the physical realm, right? But it was the obedience to what God was saying that gave the shofar its power. You know, anybody can go get a ram horn, pick it up and blow it. doesn't mean thing it's just like our salvation is based upon a relationship with god you want things to have spiritual power if it's praise worship prayer anything it has to be coupled with obedience right and so without the obedience you're treading on thin ice so when you are happy and celebrate god's goodness numbers 10 10 it says also in the day of your gladness and your fe uh, set feast and in the beginning of your months you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings over the sacrifices of your peace offerings and then they shall be to you for a memorial before your God I am Yahweh your God right so I put a note here it says what really stands out here for the Christian is also a direct command from God is this section also in the days of your gladness and in your solemn days the verse goes into talking about blow also blowing the shofar for the feast days so there are two different types of situations not one in the same as christians we could blow the shofar not only in spiritual warfare verse 9 but also in times of celebration and in times of sorrow and if we desire to keep the levitical feast like in first corinthians 5 8 having been given the liberty by yahweh through his holy word i desire to blow the shofar at the beginning and the end of the sabbath every week these are times of gladness and celebration not to mention spiritual warfare i would also blow it at at a baptism, a deliverance, the Lord's Supper, etc. I would blow the shofar at any significant spiritual situation in which I desire to praise the Father and Son and for them to draw close and to free us from demonic attack and for them to fight on our behalf. And so we started blowing the shofar at the beginning at the end of Sabbath because I got in this thing. I'm like, well, there's a lot of things Christians do that the Bible says nothing about. I was like, I'm tired of that. I want to find what the Bible actually tells us to do. And I'm going to start doing those. And the shofar is one of those things I found. I was like, okay, rock on, let's do that. And so I was like, well, I want to do it before and after sa uh, uh, beginning of Sabbath and end of Sabbath. And to my delight and great pleasure, I found out that they actually did that in Israel, uh, you know, because there was called a place of trumpeting uh, by the temple. And they would blow the shofar to declare that the Sabbath had begun and had ended. And just because God was putting it on my heart, I was not actually doing what was done back then without even knowing. <laughs> you know, and so I was very happy about that. So praise God. And so we do it now. And so my neighbors, I'm sure my, I had one of my neighbor goes, well, we can always tell when it's Friday and Saturday nights. <laughs> Because, like, all the animals start barking. Everybody starts getting excited and stuff. So, yeah, praise God. And then sometimes the deers come out and look at us and, like, 
What are you doing? <laughs> you know. Fuck are you? <laughs> right, right. What is? What kind of call is that? So, so blow to submit a, decora- a declaration before God. First Kings one thirty two through thirty five. King David said, "Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoadai." They came before the king. The king said to them, "Take with you you the servants of your lord, and cause Solomon to my son to ride on my own meal and bring him to get gone. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him their king over Israel. Blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet, blow the trumpet, and say, Long live King Solomon. Then come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my place. I have an, uh, appointed him to be prince over Israel and over Judah. Right? So he, they were declaring a new king. Of course, you know, one of his sons was going behind David's back and trying to declare himself king. Right? And so by having the the uh, the priest and the prophet and the donkey and the shofar and the anointing, Wow. Yeah, he was like hedging all bets here. He was like, okay, we're going to make it where there's no doubt, mm-hmm. right? But we see that with the shofar was used to declare something, right? They're like, this is your new king right here. You know, it has been done. Okay, so in praise and worship for exalting and honoring our father and his son, 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 15, King David was told, the Lord has blessed the family of Obed-Edom and everything he owns because of the ark of God. So David went and joyfully brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David. Those who carried the ark of the Lord took six steps and then David sacrificed an ox and a fatling calf. Now David wearing a linen ephod was dancing with all of his strength before the Lord. David and all of his were bringing up the ark of the Lord, shouting and blowing trumpets, right? Blowing the shofar. Because you remember that when they first were bringing the ark up that it was going to go slide and somebody who wasn't a priest touched it and died and everybody got scared. <laughs> and so they put it in Obed Eden's house and David watching this goes, well, Obed has prospered, right? And so now bringing it up in order to praise a God and, 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 and it was an appeasement and to let God know that we love you and we want to make you happy. We want to do it your way and, you know, casting the sins of upon you know the animal and stuff every six steps can you imagine that that's a long journey every six steps you go okay time to do it again sacrifice another animal you you know this took a while and to be dancing or six paces whatever you want to call it you know this took some effort and some time and lots of day and animal can you imagine looking back after you got the ark all the way there the line of day and animals strung out i mean just just a whole like far as I can see. But David wanted to do it upright, and part of that was blowing the trumpets, right? Blowing the shofars. Okay, so uh, top of page five. For commemoration, adoration, and celebration, Psalms 81, 1 through 4. Uh, my little highlight there didn't get all the way over. Sorry about that. So mm-hmm. Psalms 81, 1 through 4. Shout for uh, joy to God, our source of strength, and shout out to the God of Jacob. Sing a song and play the tambourine. The pleasant sounding harp, the ten string instruments. Sound the ram's horn on the day of the new moon, on the day of the full moon, when our festivals begin. For observing the festivals is a requirement for Israel. It's an ordinance given by God of Jacob, right? For commemoration, adoration, and celebration. So we have to sound the ram's horn, right? When these feasts and these parties begin, let it be known. Sound the ram's horn. All right, next one. Praise him with all musical instruments. Psalms 150, 1-6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the sky, which testifies to His strength. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the blast of the horn. Right? Praise Him with the lyre and the heart. Praise Him with the tambourine and the da- and with dancing. Praise Him with string instruments and the flutes. Mm-hmm. Praise Him with the loud cymbal. Praise Him with the clanging cymbal. That everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Right? And so we notice that the horn, the shofar, is in there. Right? And so it's a a worship instrument. Next one, warning to never do it, to draw attention to yourself. Okay, so now that we have this understanding that we can use the shofar in these various ways, Jesus gives us a warning. Matthew 6, 1 through 4 says, Be careful that you do not do your charitable giving before men to be seen by them, or else you have no reward for your Father who is in heaven. Therefore, when you do merciful deeds, don't sound a trumpet before yourself. Right? So don't use it to draw attention to yourself. You're using it to glorify God and exalt Him, right? As the hypocrites do in the 
synagogue and in the streets that they may glorify for men. Most certainly I tell you that you have received their, uh, they have received their reward. But when you do merciful deeds, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your merciful deeds may be in secret, that your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, some people might say, well, that's just a figure of speech, Lance. Yeah, but it still remains, the point remains the same. You don't do things to draw attention to yourself, mm -hmm. to make yourself look important. So if it's a figure of speech, if it's little, I'm pretty sure it's probably little, but we'll go, even if it's a figure of street speech, we don't do it to exalt self. Right. We blow shofar to exalt God, right? And to worship his name and bring joy to his heart. So to call the congregation to repentance and fear. So we got two here and actually I got more than that later, but let's read. So now we've learned about all the different things that we could do, like praise and for calling upon God and commemorating and stuff. Now we're going to read how blowing the shofar is a call to repentance. Okay. Awesome. Jeremiah 4, 1 through 6. If you will return, Israel says Yahweh, if you re will return to me and if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, mm -hmm. that then you will not be removed. Um, uh, and you will swear as Yahweh lives in truth, in justice, and righteousness, the nations will bless themselves in him, and they will glorify in him. For Yahweh says to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and don't sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to Yahweh and take away the foreskins of your heart, you men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my wrath go out like a fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Declare in Judah. And publish in Jerusalem and say, blow the trumpet in the land. Cry aloud and say, assemble yourself. Let's go into the fortified city. Set up a standard uh, towards Zion. Flee for safety. Don't wait for I'll bring evil from the north and a great destruction. So he's saying, blow the shofar. Tell everyone to come back in repentance. Right? And, and take refuge in me. Is what he's saying. So the fortified city is nothing without God, right? But so God is the fortified city represented by then Jerusalem. And so that's the first one. So top of page six, Joel 2, 1 plus 12 through 17. So Joel 2, 1 plus 12 through 17. And so this is long. I go back and read the whole thing. But I was just trying to pull out the, the parts, right, and make it easy for everyone. So it says, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the Lamb tremble. For the day of Yahweh comes, for it is close at hand. That's verse 1, okay? So he's like, boop, boop, and let everybody know that, like, this, and they need to get it right. Because I am about to come bust some people up. Okay, so verse 12. Yeah, even now, says Yahweh, turn to me with all your hearts, with fasting and weeping and with mourning. Tear your hearts and not your garments and turn to Yahweh, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, relentless from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meal offering and a drink offering to Yahweh, your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Sanctify a fast. So what is it? Blow the trumpet. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the assembly. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. Those who nurse from the breast. Let the bridegroom go out of his room and the bride out of her room. Lest the priest, the minister of Yahweh, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare your people, Yahweh, and don't give your heritage to reproach that the nation shall rule over them. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? And so we have here that God's like, Blow the trumpet. Call a solemn feast. I mean, a solemn fast. And, and get right with me. Cry out. And, and and, and repent, right? So here we have the shofar used as a, 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 a way to call the congregation to repentance before God. All right. To warn of danger, spiritual and physical. All right. So now we have praise. We have worship. We have us going to him, him going to us, fighting on behalf. We have repentance. So now we have to warn of danger, spiritual and physical danger. Ezekiel 33 one through nine it says Yahweh, Yahweh's word came to me saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and tell them when I bring the sword on the land and the people in the land take a man from among them and set him for their watchman. If when he sees the sword and come on the land, he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and doesn't heed the warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. 
He heard the sound of the trumpet and didn't take the warning. His blood will be on him. Whereas if he had heeded the warning, he would have delivered his soul, right? But if the watchman sees the sword and doesn't blow the trumpet and the people aren't warned and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have set you a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word from my mouth and give them warnings from me. When I tell the wicked, a wicked man, you will surely die. And you don't speak to the warn the wicked from this way then the wicked man will die in his iniquity i will require his blood at your hand nevertheless if you warn the wicked of his way and turn from it and doesn't turn from his way he will die in his iniquity but you have delivered your soul right and so we have a beautiful example right here of of not even just the physical but also spiritual because you got both there because there was a literal watchman with a literal trumpet had a literal responsibility in the physical realm to blow the trumpet if they saw danger Okay, and he's relating that back to warning people of their sin. And if we just read about a call, people use the shofar as a call to repentance. So we see the connection. Okay, so a missed warning. Jeremiah six sixteen through seventeen. It says Yahweh says, "Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk in it, and you'll find rest for your souls." But they said, "We will not walk in it." I said, a watch whenever you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. Right. So we had a warning from Jesus about like, don't do this to draw attention yourself. Here's another warning telling us, listen, when the shofar is blown, literal, physical, spiritual, pay attention, (laughs) you know. And so uh, we want to respond. You know, I reading this, I often wondered if like, the people around my property that hear me below the shofar twice a week, if they realize it's a call to repentance to them because they're in disobedience because they're not keeping the Sabbath and obeying the commandments. And one of our neighbors who we talked about it with rejected it completely, you know, and so such is life. But now they have no, um, no escape because they have the testimony set before them every Friday and Saturday and the shofar is being blown to warn them that, hey, Sabbath is starting. And even my daughter, which I love, she goes, it's Sabbath. You cannot work now. And then at the end of Sabbath, she goes, Sabbath's over. You can work now. <laughs> so, right, right. All right. So. Now we have the warning, right? And we had like the call to repentance. We had the warning, the miss warning. And now we have for a declaration of punishment, right? And now I added a couple more at the bottom. I could have listed them all. It's like, how do you pick one? But again, these things, these Bible studies tend to balloon and I try to whittle them down to serviceable accounts. So <laughs> Joel 2, 1 through 11 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of Yahweh has come for it is close at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness as the dawn spreading on the mountains, a great strong people that has never been like the uh, like, neither will there be any more after them. Even to the years of my many generations, a fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is as a garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yes, and no one has escaped them. Verse 4, their appearance is as the appearance of horses, as horsemen so they do do run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains do they leap. Like the noise of the flame of fire that devours the stubble. As a strong people set in a battle array. At their presence the people are in anguish. All their faces have grown pale. They run like mighty men. They climb the walls like warriors. They they march in his line and they don't swerve off course. Neither does one jostle one another. They march everyone in his path and they burst through the defenses and they don't break ranks. They rush on the city, they run on the walls, they climb up the houses, they enter at the windows like windows at like thieves. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are dark, and the stars which all are shining. Yahweh thunders his voice before his army, for his voices are very great, for he is strong who obeys his command. For the day of Yahweh is great and very awesome, who can endure it? So that, that was a declaration of God's power, God's reigns, right? And so at the very verse one, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in the holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the earth land tremble for the day of Yahweh comes, right? So it's a declaration of punishment. And so see almost see also Amos 2, 1 through 8 and Zephaniah 1, 14 through 18, right? And so we have another one. So we have a, the another part to that. Let's look at Revelation 8, 
1 through 7. It says, When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about an half hour. Mm -hmm. And I saw uh, the seventh angel who stood before me, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood over the altar, having a golden censer. Much incense was given to them that he uh, should add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hands. The angel took the censer, and he filled it with fire of the altar and threw it on the earth. Thunders, uh, thunder sounds, lightnings, and an earthquake followed. The seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first sounded, and they followed hail and fire and mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. One third of the earth was burned up, and one third of the trees were burned up, and all the grass was burned up. So that's just a little snib. I said, see Revelations chapter 8 through 11 for the rest. So here we have, just like we read in the previous uh, verse in Joel 2, 1 through 11, we have these seven trumpets being a declaration of punishment, mm -hmm. right? And so... I hope everybody's kind of grasping now the versatility of the shofar <laughs> and what it does. Okay. So, this is your right and privilege. So as we read above, the priests of God were able to blow the shofar. Numbers 10, 8. It says, The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpet, and this shall be to you for a statue forever throughout your generations. Right? So that was a statue forever throughout the generations for extended period of time. Right? So let's look at top of page 8. How does that apply to the Christian? Right, because back then the priests would do it. Now, let's find out. So, top of page eight, it says, "We are the new royal priesthood." First Peter two nine through ten. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Who in times past were no people, but now are God's people. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Right. So in Numbers it says. The uh, uh, the priests, uh, Aaron's priests, they're going to blow their trumpets, and this will be a, a statute forever through our generations, right? Because they were the priests. And then in First Peter 2, 9 through 10, well, guess who's the priest now? We are. We, are. we have this privilege. It is our right. It is our blessing to do so. Please do so, right? And that's one of the things about this series that we're trying to do is help people know how to claim the blood of Jesus, why it's powerful, what it means. And then uh, this one about the shofar and how it's a weapon. You know, in the spiritual uh, realm, and that when we blow the shofar, God fights on our behalf, and we have this right. Okay, so it says we are Jesus, Jesus Christ ambassadors, His representative to this world. Second Corinthians five seventeen through twenty says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But all things are of God who are reconciled us to himself through Christ, Jesus Christ and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not reckoning to them their trespasses, having committed to us the word of reconciliation. We are therefore ambassadors on behalf of Christ as though God were entreating by us. We beg you on the behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. Now put see also 1 Corinthians 3.16, James 2.5 and Ephesians 1.5, right? Mm -hmm. And so we are ambassadors, we are high priests. We get the bow of the shofar. It's mine. You can't have it back. So it says, I believe we should follow the same guidelines as found for the Lord's Supper when it comes to blowing the shofar. We must do so with the pure heart before God. And if you want to have it to have spiritual power, you need to be pure before Christ. It doesn't mean that you'll never sin or mess up. It's just you're not in rebellion against God. You have confessed your sin, right? So let's read. These are This is the guidelines for uh, the Lord's Supper, right? And taking it worthily. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 31, it says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the Lord's cup in, in a way unworthy of the Lord will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy way eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does discern the lord's body for this cause many among you are weak and sickly and not a few sleep no, sarcasm he says many of you are dead but for if we discerned ourselves we wouldn't be judged right and so when we blow the shofar we don't just like oh i just looked at 16 hours in porn and killed my neighbor and stole stuff from the people down the street let's blow the shofar all the way. Right, right. No, that no, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. Right? Just like your praise and worship means nothing to God if your heart is filled with rebellion. Mm -hmm. Your prayers are being hindered by that rebellion. Same thing with the shofar. Right? You don't want to be like caught up in your sin and then try to do spiritual things and think God's going to be obligated to respond to your pathetic efforts. Mm -hmm. Right? Because he has his way. We have to do it his way. Right? And it just starts with 
Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me my sins. I repent. I don't want to do that. Give me the Holy Spirit. Help me to overcome. I apologize. I accept your grace and your mercy, and and we're done with it, you know. And then we can move forward. But it's those people that go, oh no, that's not a problem. No, that's not. And you're in trouble. You're right. I I would advise you not to ever blow a shofar if you're like that. So it says Second Corinthians three five. It says we're not saying we can do this work ourselves. It is God. Who makes us able to do all that we do, right? And so it's God that has the power, not us. Matthew 9, 28 through 29, it says, When he had come into the house, the blind man came to him and said, Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They told him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, be it done to you. If you do not believe and you have no faith, you know, you have to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's God. So if you try to blow the shofar, but you're doing it out of faith and you don't believe it means anything. Well, guess what? It doesn't mean anything. That's right. You know, just like your prayer life, just like your worship. If you, you know, if you're, if you don't have the faith, it's the activating agent, obedience, faith, power. Okay. And so you have to understand that. And so I blow the shofar in faith, in confidence that, hey, this has power. All right, Jesus, the horn of our salvation. And so, Jesus, the horn of our salvation. Before we jump in, we must <clears throat> know that the horn represents the power and kingdom. <clears throat> this is the best part of the study, just so you know. First Samuel 2, 1 Samuel 2.1 Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in Yahweh. My horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Right? Mm. So the horn represents her, the power that she has in her, her, her life. <laughs> First Samuel 2.10 Those who strive with Yahweh shall be broken to pieces. He will thunder against them in the sky. Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Right? Huh? Okay, we're getting it. I already see it sinking in. All right, Exodus, I mean, Ezekiel 29, 21. In that day, I will cause a horn to sprout for the house of Israel. I will open your mouth among them. Then they will know that I am Yahweh. So obviously, looking back, we can tell that that horn was Jesus. Obviously, right? And so, but here's Jesus saying, uh, God saying, that, listen, I will cause a horn to sprout in Israel, right? And so... Next one. Let's go to the top of page nine. Daniel 7, 19, 24. And what we're setting up here is that horns represent power, authority, influence, right? And so it says, Then I desired to know the truth concerning the fourth animal, which was different than all of them, exceedingly terrible, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured and broke into pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. And concerning the ten horns that were on his head and the other horn which came up before them, which three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things. Those who uh, whose his look was more stout than his fellows. I saw in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the ancient of days came and the judgment was given to the saints of the most high. And at the time that the saints possessed the kingdom, thus he said, the fourth animal will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different than all kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and will tear it, uh, tread it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, ten kings will arise out, out of this kingdom. Another will arise after them and he'll be different from the former and he will put the three, uh, down the three kings. So here we see in prophecy that the horn represents kings, power, authority, dominance, right? And so we need to understand that. So like in Ezekiel it says, in that day, I will cause a horn to sprout up for the house of Israel. What is he saying? I will cause a king to sprout in the house of Israel. I'll open your uh, mouth among them and they will know that I'm Yahweh. So he's saying, listen, guys, authority, power, king, kingdom is coming. And so this is important. Okay. So let's look at the now. It says, now to the prophecy of the horn of our salvation. Psalms 132, 13 through 18 says, For Yahweh has chosen Zion. He has desired for, its, for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will live, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation. Her saints will shout aloud for joy. Then I will make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for my anointed one, for my anointed. Close his enemies with shame, but on himself his crown will be resplendent. 
<laughs> right? So we're getting some. So let's look. Luke 1, 30 through 33, it says, The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son and will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Okay, here we go. We're talking about Jesus. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. We just said that horns represented kingdoms, right? And then in Psalms 132, it said, There I'll make the horn of David bud. Right? This is the same horn given to Jesus. Right? Which we just learned in Luke 1. So let's look at Luke 1, 68 through 69. It says... Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised a horn, a king of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. Wow. Right? So Jesus is the horn of our salvation. Right? And so let's look as we continue on here at top of page 10 of some awesomeness. Revelation 5 to 14. Okay. Revelation 5, 2 to 14. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? No one in heaven above or on the earth or under the earth shall be able to open the book or, or to look in it. And I wept much because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look in it. One of the elders said to me, don't weep. Behold, the lion, which is obviously Jesus, who is of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, which we just learned, of course, is Jesus, has overcome. He has opened the books in its seven seals. I saw in the middle of the throne of the four living creatures in the middle of the elders a lamb of course jesus is the lamb standing as though it had been slain having seven huh, what horns right <laughs> power and authority and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god sent out into all the earth then he came and he took took it out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne now when he had taken uh, the book the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each one having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense which are the prayers of the saints they sang a new song you are worthy to take the book and to open its seals for you were killed and bought us for god with your blood out of every tribe language people and nation and made us kings and priests to our god and will reign on the earth i saw and i heard it, uh, something like a voice of many angels around the throne the living creatures and the elders and there of them was ten thousands of ten thousands and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb which has been killed to receive the power wealth wisdom strength honor uh, glory and blessing i heard every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth under the earth and on the sea and everything in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb to be the uh, be the blessing the honor and the glory and the dominion forever and ever amen the four living creatures said amen then the elders fell down and worshiped right so we just read back here right Right? Before we go on, is we're talking about how he was going to uh, cause his, I will make the horn of David to bud, right? The Lord will give the throne of his, uh, 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 the throne, will, um, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, right? And that uh, he will raise up a horn of salvation, right? And so now we get, we see this right here, this play out in the courts of heaven, this great moment where all of creation recognize Jesus Christ, the horn of salvation, who had seven horns in this thing, seven eyes, you know, and power, authority, intelligence, seven spirits of God, you know. And so this is a magnificent thing. So let's look. I want to put this in here. I thought this was interesting. From Albert Barnes' commentary on Luke 169. Let's look, read Luke 169 first, and then we'll read the commentary. One, uh, Luke 1, 68 through 69. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his, uh, of his servant David. Right? And so... Here, let's read what Albert, Albert Barnes has said on this. He says, the word salvation connected here with the word horn means that this strength of this mighty redeemer was able to save. It is possible that the whole figure may be taken from the Jew, Jewish altar. One, on each of the four corners of the altar, there was an eminence or a small projection called a horn. To this per, a person might flee for safety when in danger and be safe. Okay, so let's read 1 Kings 150. Adonijah, I'm butchering it, was afraid because of Solomon and he arose and went and hung on to the horns of the altar. He didn't want to die. So 1 Kings 2.28. The news came to Joab, for Joab had followed Ab Adonijah. Although he didn't follow Absalom, Joab fled to Yahweh's tent and held on to the horn's altar, right? Because that the belief was you go there, run there for safety, you know, like city of refuge type of stuff. So let's look at top of page 11. 
Let me go on. All right. As we see here, the prophetic declaration of the horn of salvation. 2 Samuel, Samuel 22, 1 3. David spoke to Yahweh the words of this song in the day that Yahweh delivered him up out of the hand of all of his enemies, out of the hand of Saul. And he said, Yahweh is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, even mine. God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. You saved me from violence, right? So, right there I said, we see here the prophetic declaration of the horn of salvation. And the next one says, we now know that this is speaking of Jesus. Luke 1, 68 through 69 again. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and raised up a horn of salvation for us and in the house of his servant David, right? Okay, so let's continue to pull it together here, okay? It says, now like the horns of the altar, we run to the horn of our salvation for safety. So now, like the horns of the altar, we run to the horn of our salvation for safety. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, let, let's also, seeing we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily entangles, and let's run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. So who are we running to? We're running, right, to Jesus. The author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is like a strong tower. Mm -hmm. The righteous person runs to it and is set safely on high. Right? So here we have the horn of salvation. We have Jesus, uh, our horn of salvation. We have the horns on the altar that you'd run to to find salvation and safety. Right? And so we're pulling it all together that Jesus is this for us Christian believers. Mm -hmm. And so with this understanding that like when we run to God, run to Jesus for our safety. And just like they ran to the altar and then Jesus is the horn of salvation. All these things, the, the Jewish mind could put it all together. You're right. Because they're used to these objects and these things in their lives. But, you know, in Gentile nations in the Western world, we're so far removed from it. We do studies like this so we can learn again and re-understand. So I said, we could truly praise God with the shofar. Psalms 148, 11 through 14. The kings of the earth and all the people, princes and all the judges of the earth, both young and men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise Yahweh's name. For his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and the heavens. He has lifted up the horn of his people the praise of all of his saints even the children of israel a people near to him praise yah you know prophetic for jesus jesus is the horn of god's people right and then when since we're a part of that kingdom of jesus that we rise together it's like you know all boats rise when the sea rises type of thing mm -hmm. you know saying so when jesus is an ex exalted by god and we are in jesus we get exalted with him okay so Let's read what I wrote. It says, so just like the horns of the altar, we now run to Jesus for safety and salvation. Then we use the horn of animals to create and blow the shofar before God. The connection is complete. I believe when we hold the shofar in our hands, we not are only holding the fulfillment of past promises, but also this powerful prophetic instrument signifies a promise yet fulfilled. When Jesus comes with a shout and the blast of the trumpet to redeem the children of God, we hold a spiritual semblance of the horn of our salvation. When we blow the shofar, for we are also declaring our own salvation and deliverance through the horn of our salvation, Jesus the Christ. For one day he will return with the shout of the trumpet, trumpets, and we will rise up immortal before him. Ooh, yeah, praise, praise God. God. Yes. So I, um before we uh, blow the shofar, I always wash my hands before we uh blow the shofar at home. So I'm gonna wash my hands, I'll be right back. <laughs> so this is our shofar in the little case my mo my wife made us. Ta-da! Dan. Daniel, we're going to blow shofar. You ready? And so what we do is I I'll blow it, and then we go, praise Yahweh and Yahshua, right? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and blow it and get my <laughs> lips wet so I can do this. You guys ready? Yeshua. Yeah, there yeah. you go. So that is our sharp floor. Supposedly it was from Israel. I don't know. But I like it. It's a, a normal looking show. It's not a fancy one. And uh, uh, you can buy them on Amazon. For, oh, yeah. Praise God. And uh, you can buy them on Amazon for like 20 bucks. 
Yeah, so you don't have to buy super fancy. And so what we do is like only people in our family blow it. We never touch it without washing our hands. Mm -hmm. We anointed it, if I remember correctly, with oil to dedicate it to God, mm -hmm. you know. And so uh, all my children uh, try to blow the shofar on Sabbath, <laughs> you know. And then Anna's pretty good at it and stuff, but it's pretty cool. And now there's different types of horns. There's the long, pretty ones, you know, and this stuff like that. It, it doesn't matter. It's mainly the heart and the connection back to God, mm -hmm. you know. So you guys want to do it one more time? Yes. All right. okay. Daniel, we're going to blow one more time, okay? Yeah, praise, praise God. God. Awesome. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, that was a long blow there. I could go even longer. My mouth's a little dry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was so excited the first time I heard um, the shofar because I was like, wait, that's the sound when Jesus comes back. <laughs> you know? Well, that's beautiful. So I hope everybody's encouraged. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, we glorify you. Thank you for the power of the Shafar that we, our obedience and faith in you puts in it the representation of the horn of our salvation, the blast and the shout of you coming back to redeem us for being able to blow it so you can remember us and fight on our behalf to celebrate and commemorate, to call to repentance. So many, many, many things we learned today about the shofar, Father. We glorify you, you. We thank you for being with us and allowing us to do this. And thank you for your love. And bless all those who are unable to make it today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise, Yay. God. Yay. Praise God. Praise God. Woohoo. If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit brotherlance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page for the PayPal link. Thank you, and may God's blessing rest upon you. BrotherLamps.com